Grace be yours and peace from God our Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text for this morning, as you can read in the bulletin, is recorded in the inspired words of Matthew in chapter 6, verse 12. And forgive our debts as we forgive our debtors. In Christ Jesus, dear Christian friends, all who are forgiven and need forgiveness through our Lord Jesus Christ. An 18th century poet by the name of Alexander Pope wrote in one of his essays, to err is human, to forgive is divine. I think you've probably all heard that. I am not sure how many all of you would agree to all of it, but it was a a very truthful and thought-provoking comment. The fact of the matter is that forgiveness is not easy. Question for you, is it easy for you to forgive? (laughs) We celebrate communion here twice a month. It's our Savior's. And I have noticed that when we do that, almost everybody in the congregation comes up and goes to the Lord's Supper. Why? Why do you come? Why do you come regularly? I maybe told you this before, I'm not sure, but in the first parish that I served up in Bondowell, Wisconsin, after being there for a couple months, I noticed that Most of the people came to communion every other month. We had communion once a month. (laughs) After a couple of months, I asked the members of the church council, why is that? Why do people only come every other month? And they said, we don't know. And then toward the end of the meeting, all of a sudden, one of the guys looked up and he said, Pastor, I got the answer to your question. I said, what is it? He said, well, when we were young, We not only had English services, but we had German services. And he said what that meant was that when we had communion, one month it would be English, the next month it would be German, and since most of us young people didn't know German, we wouldn't go. And he said we just got used to the matter of going every other month. Why do you come to Lord's Supper regularly? Does your wife remind you, hey, it's time we go to communion? Is that what motivates you to do that? You know, every Sunday we have the confession of sins, as we did this morning. Merciful Father in heaven, I am altogether sinful from birth. When we have baptism services, you all hear the word, always hear the words, that we are born sinful. The words are, we are conceived and born in sin. And the psalmist says, I was conceived in sin. I was born in sin, and in sin did my mother conceive me. And he wasn't talking about the act of conception. He was talking about the product. What comes out of the womb is sinful. Because as Jesus told Nicodemus, that which is born of flesh is flesh. The natural outcome of that inborn, ingrained sin in our being is the sins that we commit every day of our lives. The sins that cause us trouble and grief and even sorrow. St. Paul, in Romans chapter 1, verse 19, spoke for all of us when he said, I do not do the good that I want to do, but the evil that I do not want to do, I do. You find yourself doing that? You want to do something which is good, and for some reason or another, you just don't do it, whereas things that you know you shouldn't do, you don't really want to do, you do them. 
And sometimes you do them again and again and again. The fact of the matter is we are sinners. We are sinners. That for a Christian who knows and understands and believes God's word is a real problem. For many of the people in this world, when they are told they are sinners, they, their answer is, so what? What difference does that make? But for a Christian, it makes a great deal of difference. Because Christians who know God's word, who hear it, who study it, realize that without the forgiveness of sins, the problem is that God is holy. God has nothing to do with sin. In fact, the scripture says he hates sin. And what that means is that sinners, as sinners, how are we going to stand before God? How is that possible? But the Lord says in his word is, you be holy because I, the Lord your God, am holy. For a Christian who knows God's word, who hears God's word, who studies God's word, the realization is that they're there that there is only one way that we are going to be able to stand before God. And that is through forgiveness. A Christian knows that he or she is a sinner. A Christian knows that they need forgiveness. And the wonderful thing is that forgiveness is there. It's there because God wants to forgive us. You remember in the service after the confession comes what is called the absolution. I, as a called, ordained minister of Christ, because I am a called and ordained minister of Christ, announce the grace of God unto you all. And by the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. That forgiveness is pronounced because it is there. It is there because Jesus died on the cross. His death paid for our sins. In 1 John it says the blood of Christ cleanses us from all sins. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul says, God made him, referring to Jesus, who knew no sin to become sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And God wants us to have that forgiveness. You all know John 3.16. I think we, we read it three times already this morning. Say it together with me. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son so that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God wants you to have that forgiveness. And through the preaching of the word, through the study of God's word, through baptism and through the Lord's Supper, the Holy Spirit works in your hearts and mine. He creates faith in little children. He strengthens faith. And he keeps us in the faith. And all of that allows you and me to look forward to being able to face God. When we go to prayer... And also on the last day when we appear before him for judgment. Forgiveness of sins. Our prayer is forgive us our debts. Forgive us our trespasses. Forgive us our sins. And God in his grace does that. But you also have to remember the second part of that prayer. Right? Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. A Christian is forgiven, and therefore a Christian forgives. First of all, because our Lord told us to do so. 
In Matthew 28, 21, you might remember Peter comes to Jesus and he says, Lord, how often should I forgive my brother when he sins against me? Seven times? And Jesus says, no, not seven times, but seven, 70 times. And in one translation, it says seven times, 70 times. Now that doesn't mean 490 times or, or 49 times. What it means is endlessly. We are to forgive and forgive and forgive. As God forgives us, so we are to forgive other people. Like Jacob, in the Old Testament, we have to admit, Lord, I'm not worthy of any of the grace and mercy you have shown to me. We don't deserve to be forgiven. And yet God forgives us. He forgives us because of his love and because of the fact that he loved us enough to send his son into the world and that son loved us enough to suffer and die for us, which we are seeing during Lent. The truth of the matter is that you can't live without forgiveness. Can a husband and a life, wife live in marriage without endless forgiveness? One of the things I tell any young couple or any couple period who comes to me for counseling before they get married is the one thing you're going to have to make up your mind to and that is you are going to forgive each other. You come from different backgrounds. You come with different habits. You like different foods, all those crazy things. You're going to have to forgive one another again and again and again. Maybe, maybe she leaves her underwear hanging on the, on the post there in the bathroom. Maybe you leave your toothbrush and toothpaste out there. And you know, that could aggravate you, but what do you do? You forgive. You forgive as God has forgiven you. Parents and children cannot live together without forgiveness. <laughs> Gretchen, how often haven't you had to forgive her? Again and again and again. But to be fair about that, Taylor, you have to forgive your mother once in a while too, don't you? Maybe more than once in a while. Children and parents have to forgive each other. And as far as the church is concerned, when it comes to work in the kingdom of God, if we can't, as individuals in the congregation, forgive each other, the work of the church is not going to go on. That's what makes churches crumble into small pieces and finally have to cut down, close down. The answer to it is that in every one of those cases, we need to forgive. And if you can't forgive, it is a sure sign that you have not accepted God's forgiveness. The Lord once on, at one point in time said, if you go to the, if you come before the Lord for prayer and you have something against somebody else, go and get that settled before you come back to the Lord. In other words, forgive him. And then he adds to that, if you cannot do that, neither can the Lord forgive you. That's not a condition. God doesn't put conditions on his forgiveness. It's simply a fact. If you cannot forgive other people, what it means is you are not accepting God's forgiveness for you. Think about all of the things you do that God has to forgive. Every day, day after day after day, in spite of the fact that you know that your Lord Jesus Christ went to the cross for those sins, we still sin and we still need forgiveness. And if we can't forgive someone else, God can't forgive us, not because he doesn't want to, but simply because we will not accept his forgiveness. Christians forgive. Christians know they are forgiven. 
I should begin with Christians are sinners. Christians know they need forgiveness. And thank God Christians know that God forgives. May God give us such lives of forgiveness. Amen.